what does it mean to master an action like singing? And how can such mastery end up transforming our very lives? These are some of the questions I'm excited to discuss with Professor W. Stephen Smith in this conversation about the classical Tamar masterpiece on ethics, power, and love, the Tirukurur, or in short, the Kurur. I'm Thomas Satoshi Puxma, and I've spent more than 20 years myself coming to master what I needed to master to be able to translate this work into English. And because it is a work that can speak so astonishingly to us today, that can be so relevant to us today, and because it also speaks so, to so many different areas of our lives, I have been inviting teachers and writers and poets and translators and healers and other people into conversation to discuss particular verses and to explore how they relate to our lives and to the different areas of our lives today. My guest today is Professor W. Stephen Smith, who is Professor of Voice and Opera at Northwestern University BNN School of Music. He is a world-renowned singing teacher who teaches more than just singing, but embodies and imparts a philosophy of learning and of freedom centered around discovering and offering and freeing what he calls our naked voice. I teach singers how to find their true voice and unique way of expressing themselves. To get there, we have to remove the entanglements that block our path to authenticity. In that pursuit, we are self-actualized and empowered to follow our dreams. He is the author of The Naked Voice, A Holistic Approach to Singing, and my husband David Milkey, as well as myself, have both had the enormous honor of working with Steve in person. So it is uh, with uh, great delight that I get to welcome you here today. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me. I'm excited about our conversation. Wonderful. So for those who are watching or listening, what I've done is I've shared one particular chapter uh, with Professor Smith. This uh, work, the Tirukuro, has 133 chapters, and each chapter deals with some specific aspect of life. And the chapter that I shared with Steve is called Mastery of Action. In its original context, its 10 verses are directed particularly toward leaders uh, and toward what a leader would, uh, what sort of mastery of action a leader should embody. But as I think we'll be able to see, these are verses which also speak to any of us, whether we think of ourselves as leaders or not, who have the desire to do something well, whether it's singing or painting or balancing our checkbook. So I've shared this chapter with Steve, and um, I'll be very curious to see uh, which of these verses may have uh, spoken to him or have resonated with his own approach to, to music, to learning, and to life. So, so Steve, I'm curious, of these 10 verses, what is one of the verses that stood out to you when you first looked at the chapter? Well, there were four that I marked actually, but the one that seemed to be the most significant one was the verse uh, 618. Having no luck is no shame. Having knowledge without action is shame. And uh, I think that sort of sums a whole lot of my approach to sort of teaching singing is that particularly singing is one of those things that we think we can't do unless we're talented. It's all about talent and, you know, and people have been told since they're very young, whether or not they have talent enough to sing or not sing. And in many cases, the people that don't sing and say they're tone deaf were simply told when they were young that they didn't have the talent to do it and they believe that and therefore never tried. And I, I tell people in my, you know, introduction to start starting to singing, he says, that would be like telling a five or six year old kid who, who is an English, you know, raised in this country, speaks English, that they can't say it, their R's and THs and somebody saying, you know, you just don't have the talent for R's and THs. So leave all those words out. No, we struggle with learning to say those sounds until we can make sense and they come out of our mouths. And no one shames you. It's just you struggle till you can. But those are particularly hard sounds for children to say, um, and they use substitutions and so forth of those sounds, but they eventually usually learn and, you know, and it's all the encouragement is, yes, you master how to speak those sounds. Um, so it's, it's sort of something that, that you just take the action to go and, and there's no shame in, 
not doing that you see it's really but it's it's really about taking the action and moving forward and and that was the one that stuck out to me is is having the knowledge and no shame and so much of the time we are shamed because we think we don't have enough talent but the fact is is that if you really know the action to take and you give an instruction and given a and a uh, an atmosphere you're a safe place to, to go for it well then you can take the action and learn to do almost any action that you decide you're going to and undertake to do uh, but we have all these mindsets that's you know so shame is one of the things that i think stuck out to me and how much shame is there because we don't have talent but the bigger part of that particular verse that was the whole thing of not taking action that uh and to have knowledge without action <laughs> is the shame uh there's that actually one of my students early on who is a rather renowned opera director who studied with me briefly uh, gave me a little thing that I have framed in my studio that she that says it's a Buddhist proverb, but it basically says, he who knows and does not do, does not yet know. That the real action for taking, I mean, the real knowledge of taking an action is taking the action, and you learn from taking it how to maybe take a better action and to redo the action in a better fashion. But it really is taking the action that is the, the knowledge you have. So it's interesting in teaching voice, I have to give enough clarity of what is the action and how to proceed with the action that they feel comfortable and confident enough to attempt doing the action. And then I try to guide them to do the action better and with more clarity and with more parameters maybe, but still with more understanding by, by hearing the way they do it or what they do. Well, then I'll say, okay, let's try this again and with this kind of thing in mind. And uh, they take the action. But as they take the action, there is automatic a sort of a biofeedback built in because we always will hear ourselves and we will feel what's going on as we do this and so from what we hear what we feel it's important biofeedback that says okay that felt this way or didn't and that sounded this way or didn't and so i'm going to do the action again with some other instructions and see if that feeling or sound is what you perceive is better it's, it's a little tricky with singing because the sound is not something we hear the way the sound is outside of us but what we feel is something that nobody outside of us feels. So you really only can describe the feelings that you have that are particular to you based on other feelings you have. So no one else may feel it the way you feel it, but you can feel an action and then the next action might feel slightly different. So there's always constant feedback in, in while you're doing the action, but it just informs, give you biofeedback, how to take it, take the action again and maybe do the action better. But so many people are just paralyzed by shame and won't take an action. <laughs> They're afraid the action won't be perfect, won't be right, won't be interesting. And uh, so it's a it's a big philosophy of mine that that what you do, particularly in singing, is it's always an action. And so much of instruction is negative. Don't do that. Don't do that. Your jaw's tight. You did this wrong. And you did that wrong. And shame singers even more. Uh, into, oh, I'm, I'm, my voice isn't beautiful enough, or they weren't impressed. And um, it really is trying to say, no, okay, you did that action, and you can do the action better, and here's how we can do the action better. And but so many people are paralyzed from taking the action. So the more specific I can get in the instructions, the, very, the better the first attempt is. But then I can give better instructions and more specific to what they just did, and then make the action maybe even more comfortable and even more more uh, bigger or projected better or more confident. And of course, that's really what singing is. My um, part of what I introduce in the opening of my, my opening spiel with any student is to sort of say, let's talk about what we're dealing with here. So much of the time with singers, there is a sort of intuition that they open their mouth and sing and someone says, wow, that's really good. You have a pretty voice or, And everybody who's a singer was told that somewhere along the line. And so they sing because they like the affirmation they get. They think it's cool to get a compliment for something that they're doing and they don't really even know what they're doing, but they, it's nice to get. So confidence in a sort of sense of identity builds from that affirmation. Uh, but the, the better and the higher level you get with singing, the more you don't get affirmation, you get criticism. It's terrible, it's awful. This is, you're not doing it right. Everything you're doing is terrible. So um, of course that, Shame, shame comes in again. So the whole concept of shame and actually taking action is in the verses like, whoa, 
I could talk for many more hours than you want to <laughs> about those two things and how, how shame is what keeps us from taking the actions and that you have to really work on encouraging the actions and so forth to, uh, you know, to, to make any progress to go anywhere with anything. So, but the, the, the main thing that I say is my definition of art, which the singing art to define it, that the singing art is really a personal expression that impacts those that encountered it. I mean, art period is a personal expression that encounters, that impacts those that encounter it. With singing, of course, that action is, is I mean, the expression, the medium is your voice vibrating, but any art is a personal expression. The artist actually doesn't make sure it has impact. The artist simply expresses themselves. And in the case of like a visual artist, he's usually not, he or she is usually not around when someone is impacted by that art because they did it all by themselves and they let someone see it. But a singer usually can see and feel when they're expressing themselves through singing what the response is or if there's a response. If, and if get, they don't get the right affirmation, then they go again and try to push for more affirmation. So, but we have, so therefore we end up making our art not about expressing ourselves, but trying to get affirmation. So it's a tricky thing to actually turn it on its head, which is what I do, and saying that what we really are doing when we sing is pouring ourselves out, giving ourselves away, emptying ourselves. And that's an action. It's a conscious action that you really do that. And, uh, you know, a lot of, there's so many things I can go around and it's hard to keep it all filtered into one thing. But that's the idea. I use the analogy of pouring yourself out like wine as an offering to anyone that would receive that. And uh, that's an action. You can't, you don't just spill it. You don't spray it in people's faces. You pour it out very consciously and very elegantly and very on purpose. And then what really, after you're doing that, people are invited to come and imbibe, to taste your wine, to partake with you, to commune with you, maybe a way to think of that. And, and I think when you talk to singers, everybody knows that's what it should be. But many of us realize that much of our time, what we've been doing is trying to get affirmation and sort of make sure we don't offend in the process of getting affirmation and trying to get that instead of actually totally giving yourself away. I tell students, actually, if you truly give yourself away fully, freely, uninhibitedly, it's potentially offensive to everyone who hears it. But it's also what people want to hear. They want to hear your personal tech, your personal expression, because that they can connect to and relate to that you're brave enough to express yourself for one. So there's so many things that come to my mind just from that from that verse. I love how much <laughs> has <laughs> has come from this particular verse, and it's one of the things that I admire about about poetry in general. And this this work of poetry in particular is how you know just a handful of lines can be the starting point for an entire uh, exploration, an entire in this case kind of philosophy of not just of of singing but of of art and life and learning. Uh, I particularly admire the way, um, I mean, in my own experience of working with you, Steve, but also the way you draw out this, the question of shame and how I think much more central it is to learning than, than people may, you know, tend to uh, ag admit. <laughs> to follow up on that briefly is that an action, there's no such thing as a negative action. And so much of the time, what we're taught is what we shouldn't do. And when we know what we shouldn't do and what is wrong, then we really work hard at not doing that. And, and we're not actually given a space or a permission to actually do uh, the act, do an action because we're afraid we'll do a bad action or do it wrong. And that's all negative. And the fact really is, is the act you're doing as a singer is always going to be an action and there's no such thing as a negative action. So there's a level of like commitment to doing that action that's absolutely essential to have even a foundation, a beginning point with this art. Um, so that, I think that's a, a real, the, the word action is, is a big deal for me, you know, because we say, don't do this, don't do this, well, then we get inaction. If you get an, inaction, there's no art, <laughs> there's no art, especially performing art. It's about creating as you move through time. So there's got to be that action of, and what I'm saying here, pouring yourself out giving yourself away, expressing yourself through the sound of your voice. But the sound of your voice is actually buoyed on your breath. So you're really literally pouring out your breath. And as you're pouring out your breath and the vocal folds vibrate, you're actually ultimately pouring out your soul, 
your personality, who you are. And that's why my book is called The Naked Voice. It's really trying to, to um, take away the things that cover us up and say, nope, this is the real me. This is the naked me, the unadulterated, full, you know, naked me. You know? Uh, in fact, one of the things I, that I do, and not everyone, my wife doesn't love me using these terms for it, but I always say we spend most of our life in education and with skills trying to cover our ass trying to make sure that nobody sees the mistakes, nobody sees what's wrong with us, nobody sees the true us. And I tell my students, actually what our art is about is showing your ass. It's not covering your ass, which literally if you're pouring yourself out, which as a singer, you're pouring out your breath and it comes through your lungs, bronchial tubes and through your vocal folds and it helps vibrate your vocal folds and it goes through the articulators and the resonators and pours out. And that air is the, is like the conveyor belt to convey you out to the audience. And uh, the more fully and committed you are to that action, and the less inhibited and scared and entangled that is, then the more the audience actually can be impacted by you. But, you know, we're all fearful that it would come off wrong. And so we get shamed by saying, don't do that, don't do that. So it's a real common problem. And But explaining it and clarifying it usually gives people the confidence to say, okay, I'll just give that a twirl, twirl. I'll give that a try. <laughs> well, I love how you, you, you know, draw our attention to the, and what this verse also draws our attention to is that it, it's not as if knowledge and action are two things. It's not as if it's all about knowing the right thing to know, right. or is it, nor is it about doing something without sort of really knowing or being in what we're doing. So that what learning is really about, especially learning or teaching an art such as singing, but really any activity, any human activity, is really becoming clear. What are we doing? <laughs> what, what, what are we really doing when we're singing or we're talking or we're writing or we're painting? And in, in specific, very specific detail. And this is where the whole question of technique becomes so interesting because it's really about how clear can I be about an action, not just in my thinking, but in my acting. And that there is this union, this marriage, if you will, of, of thought and action, of, right. of, of what we think we're doing and what we're actually doing. And that we bring those things together in such a way that allows us to, as you say, pour ourselves out like wine, which is such a beautiful, uh, and I think very powerful image and metaphor. Um, and I think really points to, you know, part of what I, you know, the genius of a teacher like yourself, who really is helping people to do that, to bring thought and action into a greater harmony, if you will. Um, I'm curious along those lines, if there are other verses from this chapter that sort of, uh, if you will, resonate with or, or sort of continue this line of thought or that stood out to you as you were looking actually, at them. Actually, the first one, effort yield greatness never droop thinking something is hard because you know so many people which oh, is so hard and i have so many they're just totally paralyzed because they oh it's just so difficult i can't do it you know and uh it's like if it were really easy the yes everybody could do it and would do it but i i, I think i use the example a lot because we all tend to speak if we're not deaf we speak and we speak fairly comfortably and you know, and but that's a, that's something that took a lot of effort and a lot of trial and a lot of trial and error. And we're usually not even given instructions on how to do it. We just orally, orally adapt to our environment and our environment is helping us adapt to that sort of demanding we get socialized. We fit into society and learning a language and communicating through language is just one of those things that happens and is ex expected. Um, we don't think it's hard and yet it's really hard. You know, if you try to then at my age learn to speak another language, you know, and how to pronounce it and how to remember all the words and all that, that seems so, so, so difficult. And yet most five or six year old children can speak fluently in whatever language they are around them. And they spent five or six years learning to do it, but it didn't seem hard, uh, but it is hard. <laughs> it is hard. So the whole, that's another way that you, hit, you just have to stay, if you stay methodical and you continue in it, you can learn to master an action and get to a level of competency. And that's really, I think, important. And so one of the big, big deals about singing is there's so much people think it's talent based and it really is about a skill. And yes, some the more talent you have, maybe the quicker you can adapt to that skill or learn that skill. 
but everybody can learn the skill. You know, it's not, there are, there are cyclists that are Olympic cyclists, but almost everybody can ride a bicycle, can learn to ride a bicycle. Most of us can, most of us have. We choose not to master it at an Olympic level, maybe if most of us, but you know, we can do that action. And so most actions can be taught and we can work and continue. And it may be hard to achieve a super high level at it, but it's still a matter of dedication, commitment, inspiration, those kind of things to master it. It's not that it's difficult, but yeah, it's, it is difficult, <laughs> but, but anything that's worth doing is worth doing well if you want to do it. And not, that's another little sideline, but that one really talks about, we do, oh, it's just too hard. So we back off and don't want to go. And, you know, I can understand that there's, we have to choose which actions we want to master. We can't master them all. Um, but it's the kind of an excuse to say it's just hard. Well, anything that you do well is going to be hard. That's so. true. Well, and you know, something that I really love about having these conversations with people about these verses is that I, I start to see new things. And I've, I've lived with these verses for many, many years. Um, and so in talking about this first verse, which says, you know, effort yields greatness, never droop thinking, something is hard. Well, I love the, the accent that places on, you know, the action may or may not actually be difficult. But what's mm -hmm. causing a person to droop is the thought. <laughs> it's our thinking. You know, what am I doing? I'm not doing the action. I'm, I'm enacting the thought that this is difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas what, what a great teacher does is say, okay, you may think that, but maybe, maybe if you're doing this action, you might think this other thing, like pay attention to your body or whatever the action may be. So that rather than doing the thought of thinking something is hard, we're actually doing the action we want to be doing. And we may discover, oh, what I thought about this action maybe wasn't completely true. <laughs> or, or maybe I didn't even know what the action was I thought I was doing. So there's a lovely right in this first verse of these 10 verses sort of announcing this, sort of this theme of how we think about what we do. One of the things that ties in with this other verse that I said first is, is the whole concept of thinking and action, how they tie together as you were talking about. Really, before you do any action, you have to think about it. You have to think about it. I, I tell my students, you know, before you walk out the door, you have to think about walking out the door. But what we, how we get troubled, troubled is while we're doing the action, we keep thinking about it. Like, no, you think about it beforehand and then you do the action. And after you've done the action, you can think about it again. Can I do that action better? How can I do it better? Is there a direction I can go? But while you're doing the action, you're not thinking about it. You're doing it. You see, and there, even though it is in the action is with thought, with beforehand planning, but I would say you walk out the door, you have to think about walking out the door. But as you're walking out the door, you're not thinking about walking out the door. You're just walking out the door. That is the hardest thing for singers to really separate is just doing the thing of vibrating your vocal folds and saying text and communicating, doing that action and not thinking about how you're going to the action or how you might mess it up. You see, but doing the action. So again, is that union of thought and action. I think that's really, a really big deal. But we, yeah, we think it's too hard. We make make up these stories that debilitate us instead of actually doing the action. And then you can make an do another action and do the action better. It's it's that's that's really the the discipline of how you how practice is. Practice is not attempting something, it's doing something. In fact, I have this I have this try button in my studio that one of my students made. I call it the try button. It's one of these little buttons that you can record on it what you want and you punch it in. It, it, and he recorded it off of the Star Wars movie where, where uh, Yoda, I guess, is saying, try not, do or do not. There is no try. And uh, because seniors are like, well, okay, I'll try. And I'm like, no, you don't try. You do it. Because try in the way we usually say it means I'm going to do a half-ass effort that I don't think will be successful. But no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We do an action. And then we think, oh, maybe I can do that action better. But there really is this thinking about it and that it's hard, I can't, and yet really ties in. So that was sort of a second verse. I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's, that's, and tying in with that actually is the next one down. Um, do not fail to do when doing the world stays with those who stay to the end and this idea of staying to the end and in music it really is you have to finish the phrase 
and in, in speaking, and of course we're singing, we're saying sentences, and you have to finish the thought, you have to finish the sentence. So, so much of the time in music and singers, they go to the top note and stop. It's like, no, no, the highest note. No, 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 that high note usually is in the middle of it. And you have to get to the end of the phrase. So you have to finish the phrase. And that whole thing of seeing it to the end is also a sort of musical thing that I teach all the time is just keep going, keep going to the end, keep moving, keep moving your breath, keep talking, keep phonating and do that all the way to the end. Um, so another verse that just ties into this action and, and not stopping until, until you've finished, you know, it's, it's, it's all very fascinating. It's so much about philosophy, but this, this has been, an interesting thing to study and to ponder. Oh, it's wonderful. I, I you know, just listening to you speak here, it, it occurs to me that, you know, part of doing an action is really being in the action to the point that we're not even sort of thinking about the action, but but our thought is in the doing, if that makes any sense. So that you no, know, we're really doing the, the act of going through the door or or following a phrase or whatever it may be. And then there's this other uh, this other component, equally important component of the act being complete act, a complete action that we're we're with it all the way through, all the way through the phrase, for instance, or all the way out the door in that other example. Um, and so there's a really a sense of what does it mean to do an action all the way, all the way with all of our attention uh, and all the way with from beginning to end. Uh, and there's, you know, one of the things that is so marvelous to me about this particular work is the way that it resonates with um, the teachings of many different kinds of teachers, with people like you and with, with other works of world literature or wisdom literature. So, for instance, the Tao Te Ching says uh, most people approach success in their affairs only to fail at the end. Care at the end as at the beginning averts failure. And so there is a similar kind of idea expressed perhaps in a different language, a different idiom, but focusing again on how do we have a complete act? What is a complete action? Yeah, and it's interesting because the subtitle of my book is a holistic approach to singing, as you mentioned. And what's significant about singing is, is actually obvious, but we're a very complex thing. We think about singing as just the vocal folds vibrating and on pitches and projecting out loud and so forth. But there's words, there's meaning of words, there's the music, there's the rhythm, there's the technical aspects of the breath flowing. There's so many things about that. And they're the action, I, what the big thing I try to do and calling it holistic, and I spell holistic, by the way, with the W, W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, because it's looking at the whole of trying to find a big hole a big H W H O L E to commit to that we really stay in the action of that that whole and all the parts are looked at in connection to that that's sort of what I really mean in the holistic and it's a combination of all the aspects of our humanity then because it's it's physical it's acoustical it's intellectual it's expressive it's spiritual it's emotional it's all those things mixed together in this wonderful fabulous thing so it's always fascinating and and um, hopefully eventually fun and along the way it's frustrating so one of my students yeah those are the three f's fascinating often frustrating but when you get to where you can follow through the end of the action it ends up being fun and i think that's part of what that that verse is if you stay to the, the the other verse that came out is the verse 15 6 15 who seeks action not pleasure it's actually when you do the action and you know you've done the action well you feel a sense of accomplishment and then there is pleasure but you're not seeking pleasure you're doing the action so, i love i love that that observation at the i'll read the verse again for people um this is the fifth of these 10 verses one who seeks action not pleasure a pillar who frees family from suffering and i love what you what you drew out which is that it's not that pleasure is bad but it's that what what does one seek in doing an action? And if you're seeking what you imagine or think you might get from doing the action, well, then you're not really doing the action. You're you're trying to impress people, for instance, or you're trying not to be ashamed by you know people saying this, this is bad. You didn't sing the high G properly, or whatever it may be. Whereas the the point here is to you you seek to do the action as you're doing, and and that and then of course the implication, uh, the unspoken implication is that. The pleasure will come of its of its own, and this pleasure will not just be a kind of thin pleasure, but it'll be a uh, the pleasure of being, as it goes on to say, 
a pillar, a solid um, presence, a support to people, for instance, that can go so far as to free people from suffering uh, the way that we can in our actions or the way that we can even in a song. I mean, that, that potential, I think, is always there. Uh, and so I love that you are, you know, drawing our attention to this, um, to this verse. Right. It's fascinating, really. This just chapter, I'm so glad you sent it to me and we could talk about it because those four verses are like, bing, immediately I saw them. Wow, well, my mind, mind starts spinning on all kinds of things related to what I do. Well, I think one of the things I love about this book is that, um, you know, it, it's a world classic. It can be intimidating. People can wonder, what does this book from, you know, 15 centuries ago have to do with me? And yet everyone that I've spoken with about the book can find verses they're like oh i i get this and when this this verse too these these resonate with or they speak to something that i know myself and in speaking about them sometimes we find ourselves um seeing something more or or having our own insights clarified and so we in a sense we each get to discover within a book like this or within a chapter like this our own our own core um teaching or the or the message of that those particular poems for us in this moment and it's uh one of the metaphors that i've used uh in speaking about these verses is that each verse is something like a seed that we might plant in the soil of our own experience our own heart and then that seed can start to grow but it will grow from the ground of our own lives the very specific um, experience that we've had, where we've grown up, the language we speak, the, the activities that we're drawn to, the artistic or scholarly or scientific or whatever activities we're drawn to. Uh, and then that verse sort of blossoms in our own realm as something which is uh, our own and also more than our own, which is really, I think, something marvelous and something beautiful. Um, I think the beautiful job that you've done in this translation is makes it, make it really be poetry, because so much of the time, translations are a little bit literal and then it's like eh, it's a little confusing but you've gotten the essence and kept the poetry feel to it it feels and then because poetry is beyond the words it's got just, not just what it means and i remember in high school when i would have to study poetry i'm like i don't get this because i was such a literalist that what it says and says what it means and poetry is like you find a meaning that's beyond the words and uh, i always tell people i learned poetry interpretation from schubert schumann and brahms because I was sensitive to their music, their music spoke to me. And then I would read these wonderful poems, but when they set them to music, then it started to give me deeping, deepening meanings that wasn't just what the words, the meaning of the words were. And so I think you did a beautiful job with this translation because it really does, the poetry of it comes through really well. well. And that gives you deeper and deeper levels of comprehension and knowledge and inspiration. So, well, thank you. Thank you so much for saying that, Steve. I mean, my sort of most central aim in, in translating these poems was to translate them as poems, as poems that could work as poems in English and could resonate with people in that way. And, you know, it's so interesting what you were saying about your experience of poetry, because that was, in fact, my own experience of poetry in school, was I thought, I don't, I don't really get this thing. This is kind of confusing. It's, you know, it's obscure. We're talking about flowers or leaves or trees and what does this have to do with anything in my own life and for me the great key is exactly what you were alluding to yourself which is that there is a music to uh poetry to great poetry there's a music in it and it then of course lends itself to great music so great composers setting uh poems to music helps us to hear more of what is already there in the words, what is already there in and beyond and behind the words, if you will. Uh, and so uh, to hear you say that about this translation is very meaningful and gratifying to me because I really hope to share something of the musical experience that I had first in the original, uh, reading the poems in the original, but then to, to suggest something of that, to bring something of that essence into the English uh, in a way that people can respond to them as poems. What was fascinating in the book launch that I was listened to was the the musicality of the language. Hearing you read some of these things in the original language, the musicality and the sort of even percussiveness just changes the sort of sense of how this reads in a way. And that you could capture a lot of that in the translation was also like, wow, that's that's impressive. <laughs> it's very impressive. So. 
Good for you, Tom. You did Thank a good you. job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, before we before we conclude, I'm wondering if, if there are any questions that you had that you might want to ask me about about the work or this chapter or the process of translating it. Anything that occurred to you? Well, just the thing that I mean, I'm sort of just baffled by because that you spent you know two or three years learning this language, or maybe even longer. But um, how? Because again, I know you're a musician, so you hear tones and sounds differently, and that would help out with getting the language. But just it's it's baffling to me that you would not only learn this language, but then take a book like this. It's so deep and so ancient and so full of wisdom, and distill it in a way that really is uh, more like its orig original. But you had to know the original really well to be able to do that, and uh, that's just. It's kind of mind boggling to me, I have to say. I'm pretty, pretty wild by that because it had to have taken years and years and years of just language study to even get close to looking at, at this book. And uh, I know it's not your original language, so <laughs> that's, that's a big learning curve. How long did it really take you to master the language to feel like you could really translate this well? That's a wonderful question. You know, it, it wasn't even until I'd known the language for more than 17 years that I even dared to, to translate this particular work. I had translated um, another poet, a 12th century Tamar woman poet and saint named Avvayar, and, and that was a part of, of, of really my apprenticeship uh, to poetry, both in, in Tamar and, and in English and in other languages. Um, but because this work is so revered and so rich, um, it really never even occurred to me to, to try, even though as uh, I say in the <laughs> the introduction to the book, my teacher had been sort of hinting, my Tamil teacher had been hinting all along that I might take on such a project. So it was really that many years, and it was a it was it was two things. It was deepening enough into the Tamar, into the language, to really um, be able to savor it from the inside, to really be able to enjoy it as well as understand it, and be able to think about it in. Uh, the language itself, to think about Tamar in Tamar. So I had to learn the language of, of commentators from the 11th and the 12th and the 13th and the 14th centuries to enter into how they think about the verses. But then there was also a parallel journey of coming to know my own language as deeply. I, I know that sounds sort of paradoxical because, of course, I, you know, having born, been born into English and growing up speaking English, I had a certain amount of, of experience with it. And yet to become a poet, um, in whatever language one is becoming a poet in, requires a, a very particular and peculiar kind of immersion in that language. So that, you know, it's almost as if I've had to learn it again <laughs> or learn to hear it more deeply. And Tamar's been an extraordinary aid in helping me learn to hear it. So I thought I would bring our conversation to a close by sharing one of the verses uh, that we got to speak about in the original so you can hear a bit of the music of the language. Uh, and I will, I'll share uh, the translation and then I'll share the, the original Tamar and then I'll share the translation again. So you can sort of hear those, those two uh, in tandem with each other. And this is the fifth verse uh, in the chapter, which I think has a particularly, I mean, all of the verses in the original are, are quite astonishing and beautiful, but there's a music to this verse I particularly love. So the verse in the translation goes like this. One who seeks action, not pleasure, a pillar who frees family from suffering. Inbam varyan vinay varyan dan kelir thun bam thurai thun drum thun. In fact, I'll do the tamra again just for the because yeah. we can. Yes, do. Inbam varyan vinay varyan dan kelir thun thun bam thurai thun drum thun. One who seeks action, not pleasure. A pillar who frees family from suffering. Well, it's been a great, uh, great pleasure getting to speak with you about these verses, Steve. For those who are listening or, or watching, uh, if you'd like to know more about uh, Steve's work, uh, you can visit his website, w Stephen with a ph smith uh, dot com. Uh, and you can read about his work, you can read about his book, The Naked Voice, uh, A Holistic Approach to Singing. Uh, he's really um, a, a, an extraordinary teacher, 
uh, I know this personally, my husband David knows this personally, uh, and so it's been a really a great honor to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Tom. It's been an honor to visit with you too. Thank you. You bet.